So next we have a keynote talk by Professor Vijayaraghavan, former director, NCBS, and former principal scientific advisor to the government of India. Over to you, Vijay. Thank you very much, uh, Mohit. Uh, and uh, it's really great to be here. And uh, my life is easy after uh, both Harmit and uh, Rajesh have spoken. Um, and I can quickly end my talk by saying uh, any questions um, and, and not go any further. Uh, but let me just give you a couple of quick points which can serve as perhaps um, anchors for certain kinds of questions. And these were alluded to by Rajesh uh, in particular. Um, see, simply the challenges we face um, can be summed up um, in the following three phrase, uh, phrases. First of all, the past seems perfect, the present is tense, and the future seems imperfect. And mm -hmm. this is a construct we often end up making. We constantly say how good things were, how difficult they are now, and how uncertain the future is. And we must keep in mind that there are elements of validity here, but there are also elements of uh, you know, uh, stitching things over and not looking at them carefully. And there's good reason for that. If we constantly worry about um, you know, the kinds of things which happened in the past, uh, we, on one hand, learn a lot from that. But on the other hand, we keep embedded in the past. So we need to have a healthy mix over there. And worrying too much about the present is troublesome because logically, doing anything adventurous, if you analyze what the boundary conditions are, by definition of the word adventure, you will say, well, this is too risky. So being stressed out about the present has value because you have to be grounded in reality, but not too much. And the future, of course, as, was, as has been famously said, uh, is difficult to predict. Um, and therefore, you know, it's, it's best not to worry too much about it, but to create it. So what do we do in that context in terms of our science today? So let me address broadly two different components. One component is about how our institutions perhaps need to be structured. And the second component is about how our science in these institutions need to be structured. Now, first of all, it is important to keep in mind that the primary goal of institutions, no matter whether they are research institutions or universities, is to train quality people through doing quality science. Uh, and therefore, when you have that as the goal, the purpose of a career in science afterwards cannot be the same thing as the mentors. That is, you cannot have the academic enterprise as the primary attractive um, you know, uh, career path and everything else be made to appear secondary. This attitude needs to change. And that's something we'll come back to uh, if there are questions, but that is a serious problem in academia all over the world. And there's good reason for that. If you get a good academic job in a good place, uh, you can rule your own day. You can choose what you want to work on. And you know, you'll have difficulties in getting resources and all sorts of things you need to deal with. But really the amount of flexibility you have seems to be enormous. But let us look at what you know, institutional responsibilities are in the context of those who fund our research. And typically, these are taxpayers. Sometimes they will be industry if you're in industry research. Uh, if you're in the social sector, there will be uh, NGOs and other social organizations funding. These organizations, all of them, government, social sector, industry, all of them expect institutional impact on what their goals are. We have unfortunately converted this demand or this requirement of institutional impact by subletting that in, into the insights of institutions and demanding individual impact. Now, this has led in parallel to another situation where the goals of individuals oftentimes move away from addressing and solving interesting questions in academic environments to um, searching for the derivatives of success, 
namely fellowships of organizations, prizes, and so on and so forth. In industry, again, industry is beholden to its shareholders, and that means quite often scientists and industry focus on what benefits the shareholders rather than what advances science and therefore benefits uh, the um, shareholders. So these are the kinds of derivatives we end up chasing. Now, this is bad enough that we do this, but when we do this on huge scale, and that has happened because of the enormous growth of the scientific enterprise, we then end up asking for solutions to problems which are actually not the key problems of science. What then are the key problems of science and how do we address them in the context of what we've already built? So that really is the problem we need to solve. We can't say here are important problems, address them, uh, because we have institutional structures already and we have to deal with uh, living in those institutional structures, national structures, global structures, and so on. So how do we address problems in the context of the structures we have while steadily making the structures more efficient and built for purpose to solve this problem? Here too, I would like to stress, uh, much of our discussion goes on about solving important problems uh, related to the functioning of institutions as they are, uh, dealing with the bureaucracy, dealing with government, dealing with you know, various kinds of uh, requirements of students and so on and so forth. And they again are important and part of a large enterprise, but the focus should always be on what is it that the institution needs to do. Now, what have institutions done? Let us take the best institutions all over the world. Very, very few of them. There are some small uh, institutions which are exceptions. But most institutions end up being engines of generating wealth uh, for, the, for perpetuating the institution on one side, and on the other side, getting the best people to work within them who will raise resources for their function. In other words, the institution will give you electricity and water and a place, and you are supposed to raise resources for your funding and raise resources for students and postdocs in return for the building and electricity and water and your salary, you're supposed to teach. This has become the model of a typical large university all over the world. And those who are richer get better people, quote unquote, and they succeed better. Now, as a consequence of the size of the enterprise, there's very high quality which happens uh, at, this, at these kinds of institutions. But for the amount of monies which go into the institution, the returns of quality are relatively modest. You do have a situation where there's an enormous value in these institutions of training people, quality teaching, uh, but that is, you know, of course, very important. Uh, but the quality of research is disproportional in terms of the kinds of impacts society and the economy needs um, for the kinds of money going in. Now, let's now go, so this needs to be addressed in some manner uh, by increased institutional responsibility uh, and institutional leadership, therefore, department heads, deans, directors, presidents of universities, vice chancellors, need to be uh, focused outward in communicating the value of the enterprise and what it is doing, and also protect inward so that a diversity of research and thought can take place inside the institution. Uh, this does not happening now. Most institutional leaderships are uh, post uh, men or women who communicate your grant to the outside and receive the monies and pass it on inside uh, and, and make sure that you follow various rules and regulations. This needs to move into a situation where institutions actually uh, raise resources for the institution and for their institution goals, and in that have a diversity of people uh, employed so that you can plan both for the present um, and also for the near and long-term future. Now, this is not easy, and we can you know, take questions if there are time on how to do this. Now, given this, what are the kinds of problems that we should address? And these are very simply stated, but difficult to solve. But let me first put aside a simple point about how we as individuals should be involved in our institutions and in addressing these kinds of problems on scale. There are three levels of our functioning. One is about ourselves. And we must be, as you know, a famous scientist once told me, at the least 
really very good carpenters. In other words, you must know your trade really well, your domain, you must be absolutely the best in understanding it and do it. That's very important. That's your strength right through uh, your career. And that's critical. So that's important. But that's not enough. If you do only that, you end up navel gazing about the quality of your work without seeing what questions you're addressing. The second point, which Sidney Brenner famously said, that the only legacy which most scientists leave is their training. We must be involved deeply in teaching and training on scale because that, particularly for a country like India, that's very, very important. And the third point is institutional responsibility. We can't constantly say how institutions, states, cities, government should be run without being involved in that process. The only people who have the luxury of saying without doing are journalists. And journalists have a critical and very important role in doing that. The rest of us are not journalists alone. Of course, we must give our views on all these items, but we must also be actively involved in solving everything that we talk about in whatever way is feasible. So institutional participation, national participation is very important. And if you look today at the um, level of participation in the life sciences, in national issues, uh, in international issues, in physics, in chemistry, in computer sciences, we can do a lot more. Than that. So these are the three aspects of an individual. Now, having dealt with the institutional role about being interactive outside and with what individuals can do, what do we need to do? Our context is a very simply stated one. Politicians want solutions by Friday evening. Companies want solutions each quarter. And institutions want to give solutions in a decade or several decade time scale. So there's an impedance matching which needs to be done amongst these three. How is this feasible at all? You need long times for institutional development. Companies need, you know, again, intellectual property coming in and being able to address their kinds of issues on a reasonable time scale. And society and politicians who we elect are accountable to the people who demand, you know, what happened to this or what happened to that and so on on a daily basis. Now, this is a solvable problem. If we have an agent who flits in each institution between these three different communities constantly and takes material and thought from one to another and therefore allowing each of them to function at their pace, but also communicating with each other. This is very, very important. And as Rajesh said, you know, it's important that uh, government and bureaucracy at every level understand the value of science. So this deep communication is critical. And therefore, when we talk about public communication of science, we should not only communicate to the public at large, but we must include in the public our bureaucracy and politicians on scale. This we don't do well enough. And it's not clear that we will succeed if we do it well enough because the boundary conditions are constantly changing, but this is something that we must try. So with this situation of having the tools of moving back and forth, and many of our institutions are doing that well now, the IIT Madras Research Park is an extraordinary example of how it grew over a short period of five to seven years from you know, a shell into a very vibrant place covering all areas. And its national value is greatly seen. IIT Delhi has similarly done that. IIT Bombay has done that. In the Bangalore area, you have you know, both the Indian Institute of Science and the Bangalore Life Science clusters uh, addressing that. So these are you know, ways by which one can grow and many other cities are doing that. So this is happening to some extent. Now, what are the problems we can address? As I said, you, know, you have the flexibility to do whatever you want. In my carpentry metaphor, you must be very good at something. But broadly, as institutions, there are four categories of problems and which we need to address and we can address one of them or more of them together. The first is about what we already know and has to be dealt with. And these problems are critical today and they're going to be vital for the survival of the entire planet. These relate to, to, uh, relate to biodiversity, climate change, environment, and sustainable development on scale. And therefore this requires us as institutions to collaborate with other institutions and make sure that we have teams, groups of scientists who address these problems in a big way and institutional leadership needs to play a very important aggregating role over here. So that's really what you know, one would call the known knowns. These are known problems which one has to understand. 
Then the next level are the known unknowns. These are problems which we don't know much about, but if we see them, we'll know how to start addressing them. And these are explorations, for example, uh, such as the deep ocean, or outer space, or the microbiology of your uh, garden in your institution and so on. So forth. there's so much to be explored. And as groups of people, again, there's a lot to be done over here in a manner which has national and global impact. How many insects are there in India? How is uh, you know, temperature rise affecting that? Uh, how does rainfall uh, affect uh, life and the changing patterns of plants? There are many big issues which are completely unexplored and we, un we don't know about them, but we need to address. The second one are the um, unknown knowns, right? We know that there are many things which are unknown and we need to explore them uh, and solve them. And they're not very easy to address or solve. These are big and very complex problems. And I'm not sure that institutions or individuals can clearly solve them. And these, for example, are uh, you know, an analytical solution to the Navier-Stokes equation, understanding consciousness. And these are problems which you know, for literally over a hundred years, people have bashed their heads against. And if there are really bright and talented people who can address these, then it'll be absolutely terrific. But these are very difficult. The last kind of problem which we need to address as an institution is a very peculiar one. And these are the unknown unknowns. We don't know what the problems are and we don't know what the solutions are. So how on earth are we going to address that? The answer in some ways is actually very simple. And this answer was given to me some years ago by my colleague Mukuntate, he said that if you want to have the well of knowledge filled with you know, sparkling water, which can be used, then you must nurture the streams which come into that well. And therefore, large scale teaching and training is very, very important. If you ask me what is the most important thing we can do now is this so that we are prepared for the, un uh, the unprecedented which can take place, whether it is a new kind of pandemic which we cannot imagine, a new kind of natural disaster, or a new kind of opportunity in terms of new kinds of technology coming up and how we can use it. And this is something which is uh, absolutely uh, something which we can do. Today, in spite of all the ups and downs of funding, 90% of our funding go to our top places where 10% of our students go to. 90% of our students go to places where only 10% of our funding goes to. And therefore we need to increase the funding stream into these environments by pushing both government and industry to have training in uh, you know, university systems with all their difficulties, which will nurture talent over there. There's a terrific opportunity today because the world has got a major component in its research, which is uh, anchored on design and data and its analysis. This means that young people really well-trained can excel in adventurous science, in addition to requiring experimental facilities where, which are also available. If you take a map of India and put in there all the laboratories of the DST, DBT, CSR, DRDO, ICMR, ICR, they dot all over the country. But there are also next to them state universities and colleges which have next to zero contact with them. So unless the pepper grinds itself and merges with the salt around it, we are not going to have this 90% of our students exposed to research at the undergraduate and graduate stage. That's the most important opportunity. It's a horrendously complex problem to solve because of the way our university system and other labs are, but it's a solvable problem if the brightest and the best put their mind to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vijay. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah. There was one question. So, Vijay, how do you see the role of individuals involved in research, but at undergraduate heavy universities instead of research institutes? Yeah, you know, it's a tough one. And there are two components which uh, research can be brought in. One 
is research bringing in undergraduates into research in a substantial manner. We have, of course, over decades conflated the weight of the curriculum with the quality of what is being taught, right? Therefore, research needs to invert this. We need to look at whether it is the, you know, the stars above or the dust or the pollution or plants or traffic. Ask what are the kinds of physics, chemistry, engineering, mathematics behind that and learn everything by observing rather than learn everything and then go and observe. So there's a great opportunity for undergraduate research of new kinds coming in. It's tough given the curriculum, but given breaks and other kinds of opportunities that needs to be done, perhaps done even at the school level before the ninth standard in terms of igniting a certain way of thinking. But individual college teachers also can excel in teaching by collaboration. Uh, you know, our top institutions must be open to college teachers to come you know, whenever they wish in the evenings or weekends or you know, uh, in other collaborative ways to take on research programs. Now, this is going to cost money and resources and we shouldn't get into that administrative loop saying, when will I get a grant to do this? Otherwise I can't do it. But we must partner with government, with state government, with NGOs, uh, with industry to drive this kind of an agenda. And it's feasible. And other countries with difficult situations have also done this. Thanks very much, Vijay. I think that that was very practical and tangible advice, and also the way you divided it into four different zones, uh, quadrants, the, the questions at the institution level. That was, that was great. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Vijay, once again. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat box. If you have time, you can address that, and uh, we'll move ahead to the next speaker. So, uh, do you want me to address that? Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I can see Amit Kumar asking, uh, da, 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 and users listen. So let's take the example of straw burning in Haryana and Punjab. And, you know, over the last five years or so, um, several groups in the government of India have addressed this at one level, which is the science and technology level. There are actually no shortage of solutions now to deal with the straw, which is uh, available. The principal problem which is missed is not a science problem or a technology problem, but it's a supply chain management problem. How can you collect bales of straw, bale them, collect them within a 15-day period and get them to a location on a large scale where these solutions can be implemented? So that problem is poorly addressed because you need this only for a particular time of the year, the technological solutions, and the management of this is a very complex one. It's much, much easier for the farmer, no matter what the incentives or the penalties, to use a matchstick. So this is illustrative, as well as the huge Ghazipur waste dump or the other waste, 50 waste dumps all over the country, of a tragedy of the commons that we're unable to take management responsibility while solutions exist. So that's a very important point. It's not only a point for scientists, but it's a problem for everyone. Thank, thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. really good to be here. Bye-bye.